Good morning, everyone. My name is Jo Wellsman, and I'm the strategic lead for patient and public involvement within the Research Design Service Southwest. Good morning. I'm Heather Bold. I'm the public contributor. I'm a member of Pentic Exeter Medical School, and I've worked on alongside Jo. Next slide, please. So I'm going to jump straight in with the guidance that's on the National Institute of Health and Care Research website that defines the role of the PPI lead within a funded research project and details the key tasks that falls within the remit for that role. So the PPI lead has the relevant skills, experience and authority to be accountable, represent, manage and embed patient and public involvement in all aspects of the research programme. And this role should be a budgeted and resourced research team member. Well, that kind of begs the question, well, how do I know if the person I'm considering or even myself have the relevant skills, experience, authority, etc. And experience is a key word here. As yet, there isn't a single formal training program that provides a certificate that says you are now a qualified PPI lead. Like many others in this role, I've learned on the job. My own route into becoming a PPI lead has been through my own participation in lived experience groups. In fact, Heather and I joined the same group about 10 years ago. And over time, I, I gradually developed the skills and experience and had the opportunities to take on a professional role. Others come into it through a more academic group. Maybe they've completed PPI, um, PhDs in patient and public involvement. And other people are PPI leads because someone has to do the job. It is a requirement for NIHR funding. But being a PPI lead within a funded project is not just about arranging a few meetings. It is a busy, complex and often challenging role that needs not just good facilitation, organisation, leadership skills, but a hefty dose of emotional intelligence and excellent interpersonal skills. So in our presentation today, Heather and I are going to take a look at some of the key tasks of a PPI lead and delve a little deeper into what they entail. And in particular, we want to draw out what's perhaps missing from this very task oriented guidance. And that is what do public contributors look for in a PPI lead? And here I, I just want to acknowledge the um, that this presentation draws on the contributions of a group of public contributors who, when I asked them that fairly simple question, what makes a good PPI lead? Responded with a tsunami of extremely detailed comments and reflections. And that really did bring into sharp focus for me that the PPI lead is a really important person to public contributors. Next slide, please. So what does a PPI lead do? Well, we can summarise the guidance down to four key tasks. So we set up a PPI group, we develop a PPI strategy, we run our project PPI events, and then we wrap up. We do PPI in dissemination of the results, and we evaluate our PPI for our reports. So that looks fairly straightforward, doesn't it? So what we're going to do, given time constraints, is just focus on two of these tasks, setting up a PPI group, running project PPI events and just unpick a little bit more of the detail of what goes into achieving those, reflecting not on what the PPI lead is doing, but what the public contributor is looking for. Next slide, please. So our first job is setting up a group. Well, that seems easy enough. Just go out and recruit some people. But who are you going to recruit and where are you going to recruit people from? And increasingly, we really need to think hard about diversity. Who do we need to hear from in our research project? Whose voices need amplifying? We, and this needs, means that you need to work with the wider research team to understand the broader context around the research and who it's going to impact. And once you've identified that, how do you reach these people? And you may need to consider some community engagement, networking with community groups and community leaders to help you to reach the people to join your group. And don't underestimate the time and energy and commitment that this takes. But having recruited your group, they need a lot of support. You need to make sure that they understand the project and what they are there to do. You need to identify what preparation and support people need to be fully and meaningfully involved. This might be specific training around the project topic, or in some of the research methods they'll be involved in, or just in how to access Zoom. You need to make sure that the processes and mechanisms to pay people are in place and that people understand how to access them. <clears throat> and at the heart of this is understanding the individuals you are working with. 
Above all, you need to be able to identify and address any barriers to members of the PPI group getting involved. Remember, the people that we work with tend to not inhabit the world of research and in university environments as we do. They may not be familiar with how we work, how we communicate, how they might contribute. And our role as PPI leads is very much to facilitate that, bringing together researchers and public contributors so they can work together effectively on an equal footing where everybody's expertise is equally valued. Our public contributors are not work colleagues, they are often vulnerable and they may have experienced trauma from life changing or life limiting health conditions and they may be living in difficult situations. You need to identify and accommodate individual, individual accessibility needs and you need to keep remembering those throughout the project. Now I've worked with many researchers who've never actually had a conversation with somebody who lives with a condition or situation they're researching. So there's often bridges to be built to facilitate those conversations. So the PPI League really needs to be able to build rapport with people from different backgrounds and foster trust and mutual respect. And much of being a good PPI lead is about building relationships and trust. And that's not just between the PPI lead and the public contributors, but also with the wider research team. And all of that impacts your budget. And this is where the role of the PPI lead really starts in the research design phase. Really think through what's needed to set up and support a group. Make sure your PPI lead has sufficient time and resource to do this and there's sufficient payments and expenses budget to enable people to participate. And actually a lot of uh, a lot of time and effort for the PPI leads is really front loaded at the beginning of a project. And often I feel I've done my my full time equivalent percentage, whatever, in, in the first few weeks of the project. So again, don't underestimate how long this takes. So I'm going to hand over to Heather now. Heather, what do you look like for, from the PPI lead at the beginning of a project? Hi, Jo, thanks. Yeah, so from a PPI lead, I'm looking for good communication. I'm looking to establish that trust, respect and, and good feedback. I want them to be able to work with the research team, but put it in lay terms that your um, participants are going to be able to understand. Um, they might not have had experience of working with universities before, so you might need to be adaptive about how they can contribute. They might have to learn all about Zoom and Teams, so you might need some training there. Um, it's a good idea to have a pre-meeting with lots of coffee just to get all your participants to get to know each other, and that helps you um, set up for some ground rules so people know simple things like switch forms off, have respect, take turns, having a good conversation and um, really value the public um, contributors that they're taking their time to give you their life experience also that they can be like they might have some sensitive topics so equally have a bit of time so you know if they need to go off and have a coffee or they need some support and you might think about mentoring and training mentoring like a buddy system where they've got someone a more experienced team member to look after them or, or just good communication to keep in touch with the project throughout the project not just at the start thanks heather and i'd just like to flag here that the research design service has produced lots of resources to support you with setting up a, a, and setting up and supporting a PPI group and we'll circulate those um, <clears throat> with the resource pack that comes with this workshop. Next slide please. So this is really at the heart of our work as PPI leads, doing PPI. But actually there's, a, there's an awful lot of complexity around that task. So first of all you've got to plan and organise your events and this is where your role as a go-between between, between public contributors and researchers is paramount. You need to liaise with the research team to develop the content and the materials for your events and you'll need to make sure for example that the researcher's presentation isn't too academic with lots of acronyms or technical details or relies on assumed knowledge. You need to make sure the workshop materials are appropriate for a mixed audience and importantly takes into account any of those individual accessibility requirements and that can be as simple as something as simple as something like making sure the slides have a green background so somebody can read them properly. Check that everyone can access the meeting, whether that's on in person or online, and, and if it's online, offer trial runs. 
reflect on any additional support or preparation that might be needed? And what format do people need workshop materials in? And when do they need it? Not everybody can just access things that are emailed to them and have their own facilities for printing them out. Do you need to organise a print and post service so people get hard copies in advance? And then it comes down to running the events. And this is a bit that we probably most enjoy. This is interacting with the public contributors to provide impact for the project. But it's not always easy. The key to a successful event is creating that self welcome, safe, welcoming and non-judgmental environment so people feel at ease to share their ideas. Good communication is essential, as is good for facilitation to ensure all voices are heard. Think about what support your public contributors might need. Make sure people can take time out if they need to. Have you thought about appropriate signposting if participants need support after the event? And whilst I, I acknowledge it isn't always possible to prepare for the unexpected, at least expect the unexpected and be ready to respond. Think on your feet or move to plan B. And then after the event, you need to collate and bring together all that shared information. And pre-pandemic, we'd have reams of flip charts and sticky notes and have to negotiate those. And now it's likely to be the online equivalent or copious notes. And often it's not immediately apparent what's been the impact of this event on the research. So again, you need to liaise with the research team um, and that can often take a bit of work to actually get them to identify what was the impact for me and for the research from that event. And then you need to feed that back to the PPI group and you need to make sure this all happens in a reasonably timely fashion. I think over the years, it's that a lack of feedback that most frustrates public contributors and makes them feel undervalued. It's about keeping in touch, even when there isn't much happening PPI wise. Heather, would you like to reflect on your experiences here? Yes, yeah, certainly. So from a PPI lead, what I'm looking for is that when we set up the meetings, quite often like we might have like lost the link to the, the actual meetings that causes a bit of panic and good PPI leads always are quite resourceful that they've always got that to hand to send that link or give directions or just remember about the car parking, like, you know, how do you get to the meeting? And um, about accessibility as well, you know, when you do the meetings, keep your numbers small because the big group, it's really difficult to hear everybody's voices. And simple things like, is there a lift? You know, if you've got somebody, a wheelchair user come in and there's no lift, or they even have to have to go through a different door, that can be really um, excluding and it can start you off on a bad footing. Uh, also allow lots and lots of time because quite often when people get talking at meetings, they've got so many wonderful lived experience to contribute. It's good to manage that, uh, to let people take turns and have their voices and equally make sure they're valued as well. When you come towards the end of the meeting, and um, as Joe says, do provide some feedback, but quite often public contributors would like to know what difference did my contribution make to the research and it's really nice to hear back from researchers and um, how that difference impacted the study so yeah really good communication even you know particularly if you're on a long project two or three years we really like to hear like even if no progress has been made just say how things are going like, and setbacks as well you do have that um, so yeah just make us feel valued Thank you, Heather. Next slide, please. So I want to flag up that whilst being a PPI lead is often and on the whole a positive and hugely rewarding role, it isn't always plain sailing. And we do meet uh, lots of different challenges. I mean, this list isn't exhaustive. It's just some examples of what we have to deal with. Um, the potential difficulties of the role, I feel are, are rarely talked about, but I do think we need to air and discuss these more widely. And earlier we mentioned that public contributors do not understand our world, the world of research, the systems and processes. And we need to recognise that we may not understand the life world of the people we are working with. Particularly as we are encouraged to move more into working with communities and in public spaces, with people from different backgrounds and cultures, we may meet unforeseen challenges, particularly around working with people whose cultural and social norms are not familiar for us. 
As PPIVs, we do operate in a slightly difficult environment where there are no formal boundaries or support structures necessarily around roles and relationships. For example, if I'm, if I'm harassed or bullied by a, a work colleague, there are policies and people in place to support me with that. If that happens with a public contributor, who do I go to to support that situation? Next slide, please. So I think mitigating challenges, there is a lot you can do. So again, have a hard think about these when you're planning your PPI. Um, think about what training or resources are available to support your PPI lead. And again, this isn't an exhaustive list, it's just some examples. So maybe some cultural competency training would be useful. Maybe some training and support and resources around community engagement and the RDS has some excellent um, experience and resources for this. And one course I found that really helpful, which was actually a, a university wide course that was offered in my organisation, which was around controlled responding to challenging situations and people. And that's just giving you the skills to actually to learn how to respond to difficult situations appropriately. Think about what policies and protocols you might need to put in place. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, my university has a lone working policy. Yeah, but actually, if you go and look at it, you need to sit down with your manager and work it through so it's appropriate and specific to your circumstances. If you're working off site and you're maybe um, you know, working with public contributors in a public place, think about a distress protocol. And that's just very similar to what a qualitative researcher would have as a matter of course. So think about you know, um, having uh, you know, making sure someone knows where you're going, making sure that someone knows you've left and somebody knows you've, you've got home. Think about supervision and mentoring. Who has your public contributor got to go to if things go wrong? We often think about that for the public contributors, but we're less likely to think about supporting our public involvement lead. And practicalities, this is a bit of a bugbear of mine. If you do one thing for your PPI lead, get them a mobile phone that isn't their own mobile phone. There are too many um, public involvement leads who are giving out their personal phone number um, to, to members of the public. Heather, would you like to add anything here? Yes, yeah, certainly, um, particularly around um, handling difficult and sensitive um, conversations. Often when you um, have a research group, um, project that you're discussing might involve um, different emotions and feelings and it could be anger, it could be sadness, it could be tears, it could be flashbacks to a, you know, a memory that you might have forgot. So it can be quite traumatic. So I think it's really important that the PPI team lead is actually prepared to take a bit of time out of the meeting if it's when there's a coffee, but equally to support them and perhaps signpost them to um, the support that they might need as well um, and also little things like you know if your venue that you're having the meeting is a long way away um, just be aware like if somebody was late for a meeting that they might not only have got stuck in a you know a traffic jam but they might just need a bit of um, support to actually find the meeting and equally if they're a new person coming to a meeting for the very first time and um, to have somebody to welcome them to that meeting as well and support them. Yeah, and definitely have a mobile phone so when we can ring you to say, help. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Final slide, please. So if the, after that, you're still not clear about the role of the PPI lead, I'd like to just leave you with this quote that came from a public contributor, because I think this just sums it up. What makes a good PPI lead? Someone who excels at communication, is highly emotionally intelligent, is empathetic, speaks and writes clearly in lay language, is able to build rapport with anyone, is able to recruit new PPI members and build networks, is a team player, ethical, and can establish appropriate boundaries and behaviour in a PPI group and a research team, is clear and leads through values. Thank you for listening. We look forward to taking your questions at the end of the workshop. Thank you.